Sterling Cidery's been in operation. This is the fifth year of operation, but we've only owned it. Uh, this is our first year. Uh, Sterling Cidery was actually started four years ago by a couple uh, named Bobby and Amy Mallow. Um, they started Sterling Cidery, and uh, they had a great vision when they started out. There were no cideries, certainly in Fairhaven, and there weren't uh, any cideries around us very close for probably 25 miles. Um, and uh, so as, you know, as their lives evolved, they started to have children. They both got full-time careers. They kind of got overwhelmed, I think, with the cidery. And we had always, we live in the village as well. So we'd always been one of the best customers that Sterling Cidery had. And so when they went to sell it, uh, this was spring before last, instead of listing it, they came to us first and said, we, we want you guys to buy it because we know you'll carry on. Uh, carry on the vision and grow the cidery farther than, than they had already taken it. And so, yeah, we bought, uh, myself and my wife and my sister-in-law actually bought Sterling Cidery. Uh, we closed down the property in January and we got our license to operate from the uh, State Liquor Authority in April. So we've been operating five days a week since April. And how has the reception been from the close and the reopen? Well, it's been fantastic. Of course, um, Sterling Cidery also already had uh, a clientele or had, you know, they already had customers uh, that knew the cidery well. Um, but it's interesting, too, because with a new personality, new personalities taking over the cidery, um, we see uh, new people coming in addition to the old customers. And then, of course, this time of year, it's here we are on the 4th of July and being a resort village, our numbers in the village swell. So in the summertime, we see a lot of uh, faces that uh, we don't see otherwise so tell me about the the product and what your offerings are okay so um, yeah uh, I, I actually came from the Apple industry myself um, one county over uh, it was a family farm I was a third generation a commercial apple grower and we grew on our farm about a hundred thousand bushels of apples a year and I was making hard cider in my basement 25 years ago before this whole thing took off um, but I was making small batches. I was probably making 20 or 30 gallons a year. Um, so here we come full circle. I'm not in the farming business anymore, but we bought the cidery. And so connections I have from the apple industry uh, that I still have. So in the fall, we will actually go over and we'll, we'll pick uh, our own apples. And then um, we've got a small hobby press here, but nothing that'll handle the capacity we need. So we've got some local guys that run a commercial apple press. They'll custom press those apples for us. Uh, once that supply runs out, then we start to source our juice from another local grower um, who's got a farm market in Oswego, New York called Ontario Orchards. He presses weekly and presses apples out of cold storage. And so we're pulling uh, between 30 and 60 gallons a week from him every week. And so we've always got cider in different stages of fermentation. And you've got quite a little offering here in your uh, your cider house, I guess we could we could call it here a literal house as well. Yeah, we've um, so we're, we're operating with the with the equipment that came with the business. We've expanded the fermentation uh, our fermentation capacity a little, but basically the bar was already here. Uh, right now we operate out of just kegerators, and so we've got seven taps. Um, we always keep one beer, a New York State beer on tap, so that leaves us six taps for ciders. So we've always got six different ciders on tap, um, but we may have as many as eight or nine different varieties, um, and so not everything we have is always on tap. The other stuff is in refrigeration, and we pull it out, and we're always changing up ciders. And there's a lot of uh, fruit influences that you have here. You've got a hop cider, a strawberry rhubarb. Um, are, is it all local? Uh, materials or do you search a little bit to find something that really fits what you're making um, it it's all local materials I'd say right now the the variety that we have as well of uh, the, the fruit other berry flavored ciders seem to go over well um, but we're still kind of in the experimental stage so even though I mentioned I made cider 25 years ago I just made a simple dry cider that was a champagne like cider um, we inherited some recipes from the former owners uh, but we're trying to evolve beyond that. And so part of the reason we've got so many different flavors right now is we're just constantly experimenting and trying to figure out new ways to do things and, and, and get better at cider making. What would you describe your ciders as? How would you, how would you say they fit on the spectrum of, of different types? Well, uh, 
I, I, I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't categorize our ciders as any single type. We try to make a variety because we get people that come in here that want everything from very sweet ciders to very dry ciders uh, and everything in between. So we try to hit uh, everything. So there's a little something for everybody. That said, um, it's very difficult, even though we're in one of the largest apple growing states in the United States, it's very difficult to get the uh, 19th century cider varieties. Nobody's growing them. So they're almost impossible to source. The only guys growing those are some of the larger cideries and they're growing them for themselves. So we are relegated to right now using culinary, uh, culinary varieties of apples for our ciders. And having a quick sip, you've done an amazing job of being able to, to find a nice blend and have a different variety of all that, that process. Um, how much would you say juice you go through in a season? I know it's early on this season and you just got up and running, but... Yeah, so we had a little, you know, we could we could gauge it a little bit on the history uh, of the owners before us. And they used to only be open 85 days a year and they went through about 600 gallons a year. So based on that, we've expanded our, our hours and days of operation. So we're gonna operate 200 days a year. Um, and so with that, I, it, it, I think very conservatively, I expected at least to double our production. So I thought conservatively we'll do at least 1,500 gallons. But the way things are going right now, I think we're on target to do about 2,000 gallons this year. Um, everything goes through our own taps. We don't, uh, we don't bottle, we don't uh, can, and we don't distribute in kegs. Everything that we make, uh, we sell through our own taps. Is there a conscious decision to try to keep it local and close to the, the roots here, or are there challenges with regards to bottling and canning and distribution that, say, us as Canadians aren't really quite aware of? Yeah. Well, I, I think the challenge there is, uh, number one, is our capacity. Um, again, we, you know, we started out with limited capacity uh, to ferment and to store. We're trying to grow that. Um, so, number one, that's the biggest problem. Uh, we're just having a hard time keeping up uh, with, our, with what we need in our own tap room. Um, and outside of that, uh, if we were going to grow our capacity further, I'd, I'd want to take a long, hard look at that because uh, we, can, we can actually make more money by putting it through our own taps. Uh, probably three to three, at least three times more revenue by selling it through our taps versus if I kegged it and sold it to other bars and restaurants. So conscious decision to try to keep it that way and understanding obviously the economics of doing it is, is pretty, pretty intense. You mentioned that the area here is very well known uh, for apples. Um, how does that uh, create or impact a cider industry being you're the, the first stop on our trip so far and you're sort of the closest to the border that we've come across? Um, I'd say the way that really impacts the industry is if you are starting a cidery, um, unless you're going to grow some special, if, if you're looking to, to eat, if you're trying to make the conscious decision, should I grow, should I grow my own apples or should I buy, buy apples or buy juice? Um, it, unless you're going to grow something that's unique, like the uh, 19th century English and French cider varieties, uh, which are, again, as I mentioned, are very difficult to source. It doesn't make sense to try to grow your own culinary varieties um, because there are just, there are gobs of them and they're guys that, you know, are growing thousands of acres around here. They'll just bury you. And so it, it's almost cheaper and easier if you're, going to, if you're going to use those varieties to source those either as whole apples that you're going to grind and have pressed yourself or just source the juice. Um, that said, we have started to grow some of our own apples again. We've got a little hobby orchard in the back, back lawn right now. And that's as, that's going to be there as much as as much for show for our customers as providing useful production to us. But we've got about 130 trees in the backyard that are some 19th century English cider varieties, and we have plans of in 20 spring of 2021. We've got trees being custom budded this summer that are going to be all English cider varieties, and we're going to do about an acre as well. It's going to be uh, 2,000 trees, and we're trying to grow stuff on super high density, uh, super spindle uh, orchard systems. Very interesting. Um, we just started our own first batches of uh, home cider. Um, we were lucky enough to get some really uh, upscale apples from, uh, from a good friend of ours. Um, what would you suggest is something that we need to make sure that we're paying attention to during the process um, or that we should you know, focus 
on as making sure to make the best type of cider that you believe is what's the biggest key to it all um geez that's a hard question um i personally i think um experiment with yeasts and experiment with ways to, to figure out how to stop the fermentation and unless unless you're 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 really uh, more interested in a super dry cider because i find that uh most yeast dry ciders out completely if you don't figure out some way to stop that, some way to try to keep some more apple character in it. It's very, it's very difficult to get in, get something other than a dry cider, I guess. Uh, yeah, that that's kind of the takeaway there. Well, thank you so very much. And if people want to get more information about what you do, where you're at, uh, you have a website and, and so on? Well, we do have a website. If you were to Google Sterling Cider, you'll come to the website that was started by the for- former owners. Um, and right now it just needs a complete overhaul. So it still has their pictures on there. It has a lot of their information on there. I think we might have changed the phone number, um, but uh, I'm, we're, I'm going to be working with a marketing person that we're going to hand that over to and try to get our website up and running better. Um, and then as well, uh, we, we do a lot of communicating uh, to our customers and letting people know what's going on here through Facebook. So we actually have a Sterling Sattery Facebook page. Excellent. Thank you so very much for your time and really appreciate it. And what we've had a chance to sample is great. And there'll be photos available uh, on the website as part of the tour. So thanks again. Yeah, great. Well, thank you guys very much for for, uh, coming down from the frozen north.